Bruce Campbell is an adjunct professor at York University's Faculty of Environmental and Urban Change, a senior fellow at Ryerson University Centre for Free Expression, and former executive director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. He is the author of La The Lac Megantique Rail Disaster, Public Betrayal, Justice Denied, and the author and editor of Corporate Rules, The Real World of Business Regulation in Canada, How Government Regulators Are Failing the Public Interest. And this uh, is almost hot off the presses. It's going to be coming out next month. So uh, you're going to be some of the first people to hear about uh, this new uh, work. So Bruce, uh, we're ready for you. So um, please go ahead. Well, thank you, Kathy. You can all hear me. Merci beaucoup. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Whoops, that's the last one. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, I, you may, uh, there may be some, some of you on this call that remember I was at, uh, at your convention, uh, spoke at your convention uh, in, I think it was 2019, Kathy. Um, but uh, I just want to say, I, I've, I've been a fan of the National Farmers Union. I think it's an amazing organization and it goes back a long way, uh, 25 years, uh, well, from 91, basically, uh, when I was uh, at the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. And even before, when I worked on Parliament Hill for Ed Broadbent and Stephen Langdon, and uh, I do recall your president then uh, was Wayne Easter. Um, I wonder where it, Wayne is now. <laughs> um, so um, I wasn't sure when when I got this invitation. I was really happy to uh, to comply. I wasn't sure at the time whether you were you were you were aware that I was working on another another book, and it 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 really did. It came out uh, of of my uh, my Lac Megantic book um, and. I, what I wanted to do was explore further the, the book's main theme, which is the power relationship between corporations and government, uh, between capture and complicity. Um, and, you know, the industrial, um, oh, before I go on, I just want to say one thing. I'm also on the executive of uh, an organization called the Group of 78. And uh, we held a uh, uh, conference last fall on climate adaptation. And uh, one of your own, uh, Darren Qualman, uh, ag agreed and did a great job on the food panel. You can, you can, I'll, at, at the end, I've got the links and you can, you can access uh, the Group of 78 website. And I also wanted to tell you that coming up on March 29th, is is a, is a webinar it's called corporate concentration and power in the global food system it's by jennifer clapp some of you may know uh okay so um so let's uh, let's move to the next slide i i just uh you know that the the uh, the 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 landscape the industrial landscape is his is scarred by far too many disasters, the result of corporate negligence uh, and, and regulatory failure. Could you move to the next slide, please? Um, those are some of them. Uh, obviously, Lac Megantic was the one that I focused on uh, in my book, but I also looked at, at, uh, at others. Um, and um, John Ralston Saul called the transformation of the power relationship over the last four decades a cor corporate coup d'etat in slow motion, unquote. And the, the power dynamics were captured in Joel Bakken's book, The Corporation, 2004, and his more recent book, The New Corporation. Um, uh, and both of those have been made into documentaries uh, and you're, they're well worth having a look at if you haven't read the read the book, even if you have read the book. Um, the um, this relationship was shaped in the era of laissez-faire capitalism, dating from the late 1970s 
you know it's it's um it's characteristics that are components deregulation privatization globalization etc um i don't know if you're familiar with carl polanyi's book uh the great transformation i'm a big fan of this book uh, and his thesis was that markets should be embedded in society society should not be subordinated to the whims of the market um, and this was largely paid attention to in the post-war era but it was inverted in the neoliberal era which is still with us in part in parts with the likes of Lin Milton Friedman and Ronald Reagan and so forth and a cornerstone of of that era and it exists now is the financialization of global markets and the return of what John Maynard Keynes called the oppressive speculative power of the quote functionless financial investors and among other things it's produced extreme concentration of ownership um, measures to boost shareholder value have replaced long-term productive investments which in turn have been uh, tended to be offshore to low wage uh, weekly regulated jurisdiction and corporate concentration has increased dramatically in big tech in energy and drugs and food as you know and transportation among others um, and it's reinforced uh, corporate leverage over government policy legislation and government and uh, as you know it's become the concentration has become a dominant feature of the modern industrial food system in nearly all stages of global food supply chains a handful of multinationals dominate markets and they wield incredible power uh, slide four please the next slide uh ba, 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 ba. is there one before no it must be three the, the previous slide yeah yeah i just i there's i leave that um that's my uh definition that i'm that i use uh um for um for uh regulatory capture amati etzioni um i won't read it but i'll read what's uh what uh, your former president Terry Baum said. Um, um, basically, if we don't regulate ourselves in the public interest, we are going to be regulated uh, by something or someone else, and we must be conscious of that. Um, so, I want to talk about some of the characteristics. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to talk more about these in when I talk about measures to reduce or escape from or make uh, regulations more capture resistant but I'll just kind of note some of the characteristics uh, the shredding of resources the the, uh, the this leadership which identifies with industri industry profiles uh, the weakening of regulatory policy is started under Harper it hasn't changed much under the Trudeau government somewhat um, but the, and the, the one for one rule uh, risk management over precautionary principle etc and the capacity of uh, of of industry to essentially regulate itself next slide please just there's some more of the characteristics and you know I came across public servants who spoke who, who spoke truth to power or attempted to speak truth to power and were pushed out or uh or or public servants who became you know gun shy in the face of you know criticism from their bosses and their where their their jobs were at risk a, a big characteristic <clears throat> is the revolving door of personnel <clears throat> including politicians between in industry and government and back and uh and the fact that that in these interactions take largely behind closed doors and that it's enhanced through trade and investment treaties next slide please I, uh, I think yeah well you don't have to go to the next one yet but um go back to the sorry sorry Jill go back to the the uh the previous slide if you can um uh, mm -hmm. 
yeah, yeah, I'll just leave it there. Um, um, I want to also say that, corp that corporate capture of tax legislation and regulation has produced extreme income and wealth inequality in Canada and globally. And John Kenneth Galbraith, some of you know, in his 1979 book, which the Annals of an Abiding Liberal warned of the impact of ascendant corporate power and weakening union power on income and wealth inequality. Uh, he described the return of depression era laissez-faire capitalism uh, as trickle down economics using a metaphor drawn from his early education in economics and animal husbandry at the Ontario Agricultural College. Quote, if one feeds the horse enough oats, some will pass through to the road for the sparrows, unquote. So the following slides, I'll just put, put the slides up. Uh, uh, next slide, please. The next slide, yes. Um, I, I won't go through them. Um, I'm sure to some extent, uh, I, I'm sure you're largely aware uh, of, uh, of the, the wealth inequality uh, and, 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 the, and the loss of income. Uh, and the effect it's had uh, on, on um, fiscal capacity and ultimately on budgets of, of, uh, of regulatory uh, agency. What's, what, it, what I didn't put in this one is also that, that inequality is, is also manifested in GHG emissions uh, by, the well, by the very wealthy and, and worldwide. Uh, in Canada, Canada's richest 1% emit 190 tons per capita per year, and the poorest 50% uh, of Canadians emit um, an average of 10 tons per capita annually. I'll get to the climate crisis part of my presentation uh, towards the end, if I don't run out of time. Um, and looking at the present, despite the government's promises, apart from a few boutique tax measures, uh, this government has done next to nothing to reduce the wealth gap since it came to power in 2015. And uh, I'm sure you're aware of the recent confidence and supply agreement between the Liberals just reached, between the Liberals and the NB NDP, and it uh, points to significant improvement in our social safety net, including dental and, and uh, pharmacare, et cetera, the phase out of fossil fuel subsidies, dress and transition legislation for workers and communities affected uh, by the transition to clean energy. However, don't hold your breath that the federal government in the coming few weeks will make significant reductions in the wealth gap. And there's nothing in the agreement that I saw um, that mentions this in, in the accord, in the NDP Liberal Accord. Um, but I do note uh, the NFU president's letter to Finance Minister Freeland calling on the government to increase capacity for effective public interest regulation to promote greater trust in Canadian agriculture and promote the interests of Canadian farmers as well as consumers. Uh, and measures to prevent profiteering. And I would extend this to all uh, regulations in all sectors. Um, inaction tends to be a cornerstone of the capture complicity playbook. And I'm reminded of a plutocratic representative of wealth and power, John Manley, former CEO of the Big Business uh, uh, council and former deputy leader in the, in the Chrétien government. And he said in a recent interview with Bloomberg, he said, there aren't enough rich people. And secondly, if you tax them enough, they'll leave Canada. So my, my lack of gigantic uh, uh, research, uh, I mean, I, it, it fit the mold. Um, uh, within the regulatory capture, it fit that mold, and and you know as I've said uh, in, in previously, and if you've 
read the book or heard me um, uh, when I was at the convention, it's, uh, it's really shredded the railways agency's safety oversight and enforcement capacity. It's, it's uh, ability to develop and evaluate regulations and it's created a vicious circle wherein the loss of capacity led to its greater dependence on industry for analytical and research expertise uh, and, uh, and the outsourcing of safety oversight and the replacement of regulations with voluntary measures. So, you know, I, I also, as I said, saw the deck being stacked against, against uh, uh, public servants who sought to speak uh, truth to power. Uh, I also gained um, an understanding of the rise when I talked about the financialization of private capital funds, investment funds like the Wall Street uh, hedge fund Pershing Square, which wrested control of CP in 2012, which then became a company laser focused uh, on shareholder value. And that was, you know, contributing factor, big contributing factor to the disaster. And then, and then finally, it, I, I, and it's still going on, uh, CP is still under trial um, uh, in failing to acknowledge any responsibility so the justice system's failure to hold senior officials uh, uh, accountable, uh, whether in industry or, or government. So I, I, from this research, um, could you go to the next slide, please? I identified, uh, uh, yeah, that's, I guess I should have put that up sooner, but go to the next one, please. Um, uh, so, this is what I learned from, especially from my lac megantic research, uh, uh, that and 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 others as well that 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 governments commit to finding causes uh, in the aftermath of desire of of a disaster, and you know they commit to to taking the necessary safety measures to prevent the recurrence. But with the passage of time, public consciousness of what happened fades and government commitment fades. And the, the, the Auditor General report on the transportation of dangerous goods a couple of years ago said, quote, the window for a recurrence of lac megantic is still open. This is seven, eight years after it happened. The lessons learned by corporations. Next slide, please. In the wake of major disasters are threefold. The probability of another such event is low. The cost of implementing foolproof safety measures is high. And the cost of potential lawsuits is manageable. In other words, business as usual, and then it happens again. So I wanted to know whether, um, whether this was this was something unique to rail or was afflicting other sectors. And I put in a call to, to experts, some I knew, some I, I, I didn't, but I, I thought I would, uh, I, would, I would test the waters because this is an edited volume. I couldn't do this by myself. Um, and, uh, and the response uh, from people was uh, more than I could have uh, imagined. And, and so, and, and the result of all of this took a while was, uh, was the book. It has 18 immensely qualified contributors, 15 chapters, an introduction, conclusion, and preface. And it covers oil and gas, nuclear, health, pharmaceuticals, transportation, trade, climate, engineering, and construction, um, financial institutions, government issues, and more. Uh, I'll try in this presentation to give you a flavor of some of the chapters. There's no way I can do, do justice to it. Um, my big disappointment was not being able to find an, an, an expert on big tech or on the food sector. Actually, I did have two authors lined up, but they backed out. Uh, so I tried. Um, and I believe that the, the insights from the chapters uh, in this book are relevant to you as you work to achieve a regulatory system that pr prioritizes public interest over the powerful agribusiness industry. Uh, and 
uh, this belief is is confirmed having had a brief look before the event at the uh, NFU commentary on CFIA's proposed guidance. I'm not sure where that is on regulating genetically modified uh, plants. So, um, so to start with, Mark Winfield, one of the authors, uh, demonstrates that over the last three to four decades regulatory models under which there was a clear separation between public and private interests underwent a big shift. And the new modus, modus operandi became one of partnership, mutual interests, use of guidance documents, voluntary measures, et cetera. The, basically the merging of public and private interests. And under these regulatory models, government delegates to companies the responsibility for key functions such as safety oversight, prevention of critical information concerning public health, safety, and environmental protection. In the nuclear sector, for example, uh, author Teresa McClenahan writes, the regulator's approach to licensing consists of quote unquote guidance rather than binding regulation. It includes over delegation to staff. It lacks consistency. It provides conditions for bias, utilizes ambigu ambiguous requirements and sets the conditions in place for self-regulation. This approach creates a dynamic where quote, inside baseball discussions of licensee staff um, whoop, 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 I've lost it, <laughs> uh, but it, it basically uh, trumps the public, public interest. So that's, uh, uh, that's kind of, um, I think, re relative to, uh, to the issue you're having with, uh, with seeds right now. Um, they e examine the interplay uh, in, in all of the sectors between policy, legislation, regulation, how regulate regulatory oversight bodies with rare exceptions, and there are a few, uh, were, were gutted to resources and personnel and how regulatory enforcement and accountability have been ho ho howled out, hollowed out. So it's not just in the transportation sector uh, and how the intent of legislation has at times been distorted by implementing regulations. The existence of public private networks of corruption and how powerful corporations have used their insider status to avoid serious legal scrutiny. Uh, including criminal wrongdoing, and and and, and uh, uh, it, this is entrenched in the structure of the system, uh, as demonstrated by the chapters on at the SNC Lavalin case and the construction industry. Um, as I said political agendas are set from the top in private meetings with cabinet ministers, committee chairs, senior bureaucrats, and corporations dominate interventions both in public consultations and in lobbying. Uh, they commission studies by consultants or analysts at industry supported think tanks who then produce self-serving data presented as sound science or, or authoritative cost benefit assessments. They employ merchants of doubt, public relations firms hired to intentionally confuse people and undermine confidence in scientists with the help of accommodating media uh, and politicians. One of the authors, Edgar Schmidt, interesting fellow, former general counsel in the Department of Justice. And he, his chapter provides a damning critique of how the DOG's criteria for evaluating the legitimacy of departmental regulatory proposals underwent a major change. The Department of Justice no longer asked itself in its examination of regulations whether it believed those regulations to be legally valid. Rather, it asked only whether, in his words, they had the faintest hopes of being legally valid, or put another way, quote, where the certainty of illegality is 100%. 
or very near it. In essence, the change criteria of the DOJ privileges the policy preference and interests of the government of the day and its ministers, rather than decisions already taken by the legislature through the people's elected representatives and expressed in its constitution. <coughs> Excuse me. The chapters on the petroleum industry, I think deepen our understanding of how it, how it covers up its role in driving uh, ballooning greenhouse gas emissions and its ongoing efforts to torpedo policies designed to transition away from fossil fuels. And these corporations have known for decades uh, about the dangers to the planet uh, from GHG emissions. And they these days cynically present themselves as leaders in the effort to reduce greenhouse gases. Jason McLean demonstrates how the mainstream media has aided and abetted regulatory capture of, of what he calls the public policy imagination, shaping the terms of discussion and debate and thereby legitimizing climate policy in action. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, leading healthcare uh, uh, experts contributed, Michelle Brill Edwards and Joel Lection shed light how the government disabled the Food and Drugs Act and regulations on the inner workings of capture and complicity in the relationship between the pharmaceutical industry and Health Canada's drug approval industry which in some cases uh, led to the approval of, of unsafe drugs causing widespread illness and, and death. Um, and um, the precautionary approach to drug regulation policy was, was replaced with a, a risk management approach to health and safety uh, with companies providing most of the funding to the drug certification agency speed of cer certification uh, and commercial confidentiality take precedence over safety. Um, uh, right selection, when government adopts the values of private industry, it's in essence telling citizens that the needs and values of the private sector uh, take precedence over health. And uh, Brill Edwards uh, demonstrates how senior Health Canada officials with medical expertise who were offside with the political agenda were sidelined or push, pushed out of office and replaced by non-medical managers. And she, she searched most, more recently the Auditor General report of 2021, which singled out poor decision-making related to the pandemic by managerial officials lacking in subject matter expertise. And it... it, it uh, because, uh, because of the complexity of international regulatory uh, frameworks, uh, in, they're heightened in aviation and the shipping industry because, um, because of the outsourcing of regulatory uh, uh, oversight to industry finance private uh, international classification society. Uh, Stuart True from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives uh, has written the chapter on international trade and investment agreements. Uh, and he talks about how these cooperation uh, committees, they're largely hidden from public scrutiny uh, by outside public interest groups, uh, by legislatures, and their aim is to reduce the so-called uh, regulatory burden on multinationals. Um, so Pitchin and Pringle conclude in their uh, chapter on, conclude that the financial regulator doesn't quite fit easily into the capture, regulatory capture narrative, though they point to its existence and, and in the past and that it remains uh, a risk. Uh, and uh, reinforces the point, I think, this, uh, uh, that one has to, you know, one can't just generalize across, across sectors. It's important to do the research in every sector to, to get a sense of its extent and nature and so forth. Okay, so 
I'm going to turn to to some uh, some uh, suggestions, measures that can be taken to to make regulations more capture resistant. So, slide eleven, please. So it's a it's a it's a long one. I'll try to keep it up for a while. Uh, but you know they have to do with uh, you know to to rebalance the relationship and minimize the vulnerabilities to capture. Uh, they're and they're they're drawn. The ones that that uh, I talk about in the book are drawn from my observations and those of my colleagues. And I should note that uh, authors outline specific measures specific uh, to their sectors as well. These are kind of the the broad broad base. So, you know, this is a, a list of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, how to make regulations more capture resistant, uh, or what needs to be done, obviously restoring resources. Uh, 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 and, and, and if, if, you know, if, if, if they're not restored, uh, or they're not significantly significantly uh, uh, improve, then then revert to direct to prescriptive regulations and safety oversight, and building the the in-house capacity uh, uh, to uh, to initiate and evaluate proposals, uh, ensure that uh, that regulatory agencies are not conflicted by dual mandates of of both promotion and, 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 and safety. Uh, and they don't report to ministers who have uh, dual uh, mandates. Uh, for example, in Teresa McLennan's chapter on the nuclear industry uh, revealed that the regulator, uh, Canadian Nuclear Safety uh, Commission, continues to work actively on behalf of the industry, promoting, for example, small modular reactors as part of the solution to the cr climate crisis without sufficient uh, consideration of the dangers. Uh, so, you know, the statutory uh, uh, separation of accountability um, has not changed as yet, as far as I know, um, between the regulator and the, the, the industry and the natural resources uh, Canada. Uh, as promoter, so safety tends to get lost in the in the shuffle. Um, uh, another one is is uh, you can see uh, these up there. Uh, lift the veil on business uh, government activity protected under commercial confidentiality and mandate greater uh, transparency, public admission uh, information disclosure which includes strengthening the access to uh, information legislation. It's, it's pretty weak and it's gotten weaker uh, and making fully transparent uh, corporate financial resources allocated to lobbying, supporting think tanks, university departments, et cetera. Um, also ensure that the costs of uh, regulatory oversight are paid out of general tax revenue and not out of a corporate levy, which is done, for example, with Health, Health Canada's uh, drug approvals, uh, as well the the Alberta Energy uh, Regulator. Uh, revolving revolving door is is a is a common phenomenon, uh, as I've mentioned, and they should include. Uh, uh, conflict of interest and, and ethical standards and a cooling off period, moving back, uh, limiting movement back and forth uh, uh, between the industry and as, as, as lobbyists uh, and, and government. And also to require government officials to reveal networks of private sector contacts uh, uh, relevant to their work uh, as regulators and also robust whistleblower protections, both for public and private sector employees. And we have one of the weakest whistleblower protection laws uh, anywhere. Um, do you wanna switch to the, the, the next slide, please? Uh, just to give you an idea um, 
uh, of uh, of uh, you can you can you can see these as I'm talking about about some of them. Um, revise the Department of Justice criteria, as I mentioned, for evaluating proposed regulations to ensure that they're consistent with the legislative intent of the laws passed by the parliament, uh, restructuring of the cabinet directive on regulatory policy, which was introduced by the Harper government, uh, eliminate the red tape reduction act, uh, this focus on red tape as if, you know, as if that's what they, as if, you know, kind of laying aside the most important uh, function is, is safety and not, uh, and not uh, um, uh, you know burdens on on corporations and the one for one rule and all, all of you know the, and and you know limit the tendency and the profession preference for voluntary uh, 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 codes uh, over over regulations and prioritize precautionary principle over over. Uh, risk management when we're talking about health, safety, and the environment, and limit the ability of corporations to play one jurisdiction off against a, another in order to, to, to minimize uh, these burdens and labor costs and taxes and so forth, and reform uh, the civil and criminal liability regimes to hold senior governmental officials and corporate executives, directors, and owners accountable for decisions that endanger public health, safety, and the environment, and for those whose actions involve bribery or personal gain. And there are examples of that in, in uh, some of the chapters. Um, and the, the, the restore the original Privy Council guidelines for ministerial um, responsibility, which were changed um, on, in the Harper government. So uh, as follows, ministers are individually responsible to parliament and the prime minister for their own actions and for those of their department, including the actions of all officials under their management and directions, whether or not ministers had prior knowledge. That was the original one and it was weakened dramatically. Um, okay. So I'm going to turn now. I'm not sure how much time I have, but uh, you've got ten minutes. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. How it's how has the relationship affected uh, efforts to address the the climate crisis? So it's most conse consequential in the fuel sector. What William Carroll calls an ecosystem of a, uh, of obstruction comprised of officials and lobbyists interacting with industry associations. It continues to obstruct the transition away from fossil fuels, and it includes a revolving door between officials and, and, uh, and senior um, uh, uh, government officials. And, and, and there's also in, in, in the chapter on, on fossil fuels, uh, uh, that in tandem with compliant governments has been largely responsible uh, for the fact that Canada's climate emissions, despite promises to lower them, have risen 26% since 1990, the baseline for the Kyoto Protocol, with, with governments repeatedly breaking uh, their commitments. And the 2021 report by the Auditor General really blasted the government saying, we can't continue to go from failure to fail. We need action results, not just more targets and plans. So, so and Canada is through its private and public institutions is providing more finance to the fossil fuel sectors per Canada than any other G, G country. And crown corporations like the Export Development Corporations are invested. Uh, Canada's two largest pension funds are as well, although the Caisse de Depot has committed to divest from its oil investments and cut its carbon footprint. Um, but this international body, the Climate Performance Index, ranked 61 countries on their progress in reducing greenhouse gas emissions uh, on energy consumption, re renewable energy in, in Canada, ranked near the bottom, 58 out of 63. Uh, the Glasgow Summit last year brought together Many nations, 200, um, 
but the fossil fuel industry registered the most delegates who were cloistered within in uh, national delegation. Although there were some concrete advances overall, it was seen as a failure. And the Secretary General reacting to the final report was disappointed. He said, we're still knocking at the door of a climate crisis, which is a code red for humanity. Uh, the Prime Minister's pledge to cap and then cut emissions from the oil, the oil and gas sector, carefully separating emissions from production and no commitment to phase out production, which is expected to continue to grow, at least for the last next few decades. Um, uh, so it appears that, that the Liberal NDP agreement with, that the Trudeau government uh, will finally pass a, a, a Just Transition Act to support workers, uh, which, which, uh, which is long overdue, uh, and also to phase out fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and it could do well to adopt the NFU proposal to establish a dedicated public institution modeled after the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration to coordinate efforts to reduce emissions in agriculture to meeting Canada's economy-wide targets and develop and implement urgently need adaptation uh, measures. Um, so could, you, could you go to the next slide? It just, uh, it, it's, uh, I, it, it, I mentioned this at the outset, it's, it's, uh, it's the, the links to the panels from the, uh, the group of 78 uh, uh, conference last fall and also the upcoming uh, March 29th uh, uh, webinar. Web, webinar. Um, yeah, so I wanna leave you and I'm coming to the end with the following questions. Um, can we break out of the capture and complicity mode mold? Is a paradigm shift possible? In this existential climate moment, the stakes could not be higher for this country and for the world. The capture and complicity relationship has co corroded our democracy, among other things, creating extreme wealth inequality, fueling widespread citizens disenfranch disenfranchisement from the political process, breeding anger and anxiety about their future economic security. And I would say making them open to alternatives that involve violent conflict and autocratic leadership options. The ECOS pollster Frank Graves and Michael Valpe's analysis uh, recently of the factors behind the truckers convoy highlights the sympathy the convoy garnered from one third of the Canadian public disproportionately higher among youth and those who identify as working class. And they link this support to the long held belief by almost two thirds of Canadians that the growing concentration of wealth could result in violent class conflict and the number who believe this rises to 70 8% for those under 35 and 81% for those who I do who identify as working class. Bruce, I it's five to, minutes. Five oh, minutes. I, thank you. I'm going to be under under uh, under the um, uh, uh, under the bar. Um, but you know, in the end, I you know I choose to believe that a paradigm shift is possible. That the corporate government relationship can be re rebalanced, that a major prolonged uh, inequality can be achieved as occurred in the decades after World War II, and that global warming can be kept to 1.5 Celsius or less by 2050. But it requires political will and collective action, widespread citizen mobilization, labor, farm, environmental, public interest groups using a broad toolbox of, act, toolbox of actions, nonviolent protests, advocacy, campaigns, and more. Determined political and bureaucratic leadership is also needed to break the corporate stranglehold on power and complicity by its government enablers. <clears throat> 
the emergence of a pyramid of wealth and power focused on maintaining the status quo and resistant to systemic change was a central factor identified by author and archeologist Ronald Wright in his 2004 Massey Lectures entitled A Short History of Progress, in which he examines factors have, that have led to the collapse of past civilization going back thousands of years, which he calls progress traps. He compares these to black boxes retrieved from fallen airliners, which teach us about the dangers facing our civilization today. Nuclear war, climate apocalypse. In a recent interview with CBC, uh, Wright is skeptical or perhaps less hopeful than when he first gave those lectures about the ability at, of those at the apex at the apex of the social pyramid to see beyond the short term, to confront the climate threat to the planet and avoid civilization collapse. I believe the gravitational pull of capture and complicity can be resisted. To borrow from Bob Dylan, it's not dark yet, but it's getting there. And despite the odds tilting against such a change, such a transformation, I would say resignation is not an option for us. To borrow from the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci, we need to practice, quote, the pessimism of intelligence and the optimism of will. So on that happy note, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much. And you can go to the, yes, and you can go to the, the last, Last slide, which is a little blurb about the book. So thank you. Really appreciate uh, your listening to, uh, to my presentation. Thanks very much, Bruce.